How do you understand history? Who controls the message? Is the media muzzled, lazy, confused, manipulated? How do you create personal and political change? I invite you to join me in exploring one of the most pressing and complex issues of our day. In 48, there was a lot of fighting around our house. My eldest sister was shot. A bullet came over our heads. In 1967, I would call it the transformation from, ch from childhood to hell. After the 67 war, if you weren't physically in the place where you were, you had no right to live in that place. They're Palestinians, refugees. This can't go on for much longer. People's eyes are beginning to open to what Israel's doing. My name is Alice Rothschild, and I was born in 1948 in Boston. I'm an American Jew, interestingly enough, born the same year that the State of Israel was founded. My parents were first-generation Americans who instilled in us a sense that Jews were a distinct and often endangered tribe. This Jewishness soon became grounded in our love for Israel. But as I grew up, I realized I had never actually met an Arab before, and I only knew one side of this complex historical narrative. Starting in the 1990s, I began an active search for the voices that I had never heard. Um, and you know, people accuse my film of being unbalanced, and what I try to explain is that this is the history that you haven't learned. So I didn't try to make the history of the world, I tried to make the history of the people that you don't usually hear. Um, so balance is a very tricky thing, but thank you for that comment. This is not a Jewish story or an Arab story or a Muslim story. Um, this is a universal story and we all need to be interested in it. And you know, in terms of the role of Christians in the United States, I mean, if you look at the Christian Zionist movement, who are actually a much more powerful yeah. movement than the Jews, um, Christian Zionists are very supportive of the settlements and the growth of settlements in the occupied territories. You'll be in some of these settlements, and I'm not talking a few huts on a hill, I'm talking about massive cities, and there are plaques to Hagee and to other you know, mega church figures who have spent millions of dollars supporting the settlement movement, because the Christian Zionists want all of us Jews to go back so that we can all die in the apocalypse and Christ can come, and that just doesn't seem like a good plan to me. So, um, <laughs> But the point is, the Christian Zionists are actually a very, very powerful force in this country. And that united with groups like APAC, which is uh, a Jewish lobbying organization that I put on par with uh, the NRA in terms of power and money and influence, they really control our Congress. So um, if a congressperson expresses a faint uh, sympathy with the plight of a Palestinian or make some critical come about Israel, the odds are they're not going to get elected the next cycle. And this happens over and over again. State of Israel, you know, it becomes increasingly clear that you can't be a democracy and privilege uh, one group over another group. Um, you can't be a democracy and um, have institutionalized and legalized a second-class citizenship. So I, I don't know quite what you call this, whether it's an ethnocracy or, I'm not sure the exact name, but I, I think that what Israel is coming, what the Israeli uh, leadership is coming uh, to heads with is that you gotta choose. If you're a democracy, then you can't behave, you can't have the laws and the behaviors that are characteristic of the state. And, building settlements and Jewish-only roads and Jewish-only bus systems. I mean, these are political, moral uh, questions. This isn't about whether people are Jewish or not. And so what I think one of the big problems is is that no one wants to be called an anti-Semite. I mean, that's a horrendous thing to call someone. But that, just like the Holocaust, that is being used to muzzle people. And so what I suggest to people is that if you're not a Jewish person and you're making you know, principled criticism of the behavior of the Israeli government or the Israeli Defense Force. Find your Jewish allies. Stand together. Because if we all stand together, we can protect each other. I mean, if someone calls me an anti-Semite, you know, it doesn't do anything for me because I'm Jewish. And it just doesn't, you know, they call me a self-hating Jew. I also don't buy it. So it doesn't have the power to shut me up. But it could have the power to shut you up. So if I'm standing with you, then we're in this together. 
And so I think you know the power of um, groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, which is a national organization. You know, you should go on their website if you're not familiar with them. So I do think that if you are in the mainstream Jewish community, um, there is in most communities a very clear-cut line where if you support BDS, you will lose friends. And this is what I consider a great tragedy. Um, and what I often say to people is, you know, the way that I look at this conflict right now is that Palestinians have been living under occupation for, you know, since 67, and we could, you know, go back to 48 to colonization, but I don't start there. Um, and they have a resistance movement. And when they had a violent resistance movement, everybody condemned them. And now they have a nonviolent resistance movement, and everybody condemns them. So what exactly are they supposed to do? So I really urge people to re-examine what their issues are and to look at the idea that, first of all, the Palestinians have a right to resist and that they are oppressed and that a nonviolent resistance movement is the best thing going. Um, and it's also very smart um, because if you actually read the call, it's uh, you know, calling for an end to the occupation, it's calling for a resol uh, treating um, uh, Palestinians with Israeli citizenship as equal citizens, and it's calling for a resolution of the refugee issue. And for th that last one is the one that Jews get most ballistic over because it calls for the support of the right of return of Palestinian refugees. And you know, people get very crazy about that, and I really understand that. But the things that I suggest to people is that, first of all, Israel's going to have to change in some ways. The, the course that it's on is not a viable long-term course that's, that's going to be successful for everybody that has to get along in that region. Um, the other thing is that if you look at all the kinds of conferences and studies and books and people, smart people thinking about the right of return, they're not talking about Muhammad going back to Jaffa and throwing you know, Moshe out of his house. They're trying to figure out we have millions and millions of people living in refugee camps. We have all these people who have lost their land. Until there's some kind of restorative justice, there's never going to be a resolution to this conflict. So let's figure out all the creative ways that we could get enough justice so that this could be over and that people could move on. That this is a battle about land. So it's not a battle between Jews and Muslims. It's not a battle about religion. It's a battle about land. And if you look at what's going on in uh, the West Bank, um, the West Bank is now divided into three areas. Area A is the area around the cities, which are the Palestinian cities, which are supposedly controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Um, area C is 65% of the West Bank, which is where the settlements are going. And Area B is a kind of in-between, partially Israeli, partially Palestinian controlled. And as I said, Area C is totally Israeli controlled. So the Israelis have, and I do suggest People grab this um, visual map because it, it's a really good visual of all the numbers that are being thrown around. Mm -hmm. But if the Israelis now control the Jordan Valley and they control the settlements and all the areas around the settlements and they control um, the 7 to 8 percent that they got in the first war, um, you know, basically this is about taking land and putting facts on the ground and growing the number of places the Jews live, the Palestinians don't live. And so I think it's good to understand that this is a battle about land. Um, I think that there are many Jews that really don't know and that have never heard the word Nakba and that just, you know, have sort of willfully closed their minds to this history because it's too difficult and too painful and too challenging. And the irony for me as a member of the Jewish community is that Jews are so progressive on civil rights and gay rights and environment and all the other things, but when it comes to this, there's sort of a closing of the brain for a lot of people. And um, I'll just end my little comment here with, uh, we were having um, uh, an event in Boston and there was this guy who was a professor and he was a leader in the Jewish community. And one of my friends said to him, you know, why is Zionism so important? I mean, Zionism is a fairly recent development. I mean, when the Hillel started in the college campuses, they were not Zionist, which is most people don't remember. And then it became much more, you have to be a Zionist to be a Jew. And he looked at her and he said, you don't understand, Israel is the religion. And so in a lot of Jewish communities, there's a confusion between the religion and the country and the political movement of Zionism. And I think that that's a real disservice, first of all, to the religion 
And it also means that we can't have an in intelligent conversation about Israeli governmental policy and Zionism, which we absolutely need to do. Just like we need to have a conversation about US policy. I mean, you, know, you can be a patriotic American and oppose almost everything the US government does <laughs> abroad, and you're still a patriotic American. You ha we have to be able to have those conversations, and it's really hard to do in the Jewish community. I mean, I've talked with people who say there's no occupation. And if you look at the legalities of this, when the Israelis occupied the West Bank and Gaza, they made a very careful decision not to call it occupied. They call it acquired. Right. <laughs> and because it's acquired, it doesn't have to go according to the rules of occupation, so you can settle it. So, you know, you can play with the language and make it into something that it's not. But this is the battle that we need to work on. This is why education is so critically important. So thank you. Thank you. We have Jimmy Carter, who used the word apartheid. So now you say the word apartheid, and less people get totally freaked out. You have a war and everybody's got their smartphones and they're sending you documentation minute by minute of exactly what's happening. So a huge amount of history that used to be totally invisible is now visible. You have a huge nonviolent resistance movement in Palestine that has now gone international, that has organized major boycotts and sanctions, and not sanctions, boycotts and divestments around major global industries that are having an impact. I mean, Veolia, which is a huge global industry that does transportation and garbage dumps and all sorts of stuff like that, um, got, uh, lost their contract in Boston to do the, the school buses. And there was a unity between the unions that were getting screwed and the um, activists on Israel-Palestine who were saying, wait a minute, they're building Jewish-only trains and buses and they manage a huge garbage dump in the West Bank and this guy, is, this is an immoral company. <laughs> and they lost the contract. Um, so there are over and over again companies that have been uh, affected by the BDS movement. There is so much more awareness. Um, the Palestinians are talking about going to the International Criminal Court. There are Israeli generals who are afraid to go to Europe because they're afraid they're gonna get arrested. I mean, the tenor is changing. Because Dorothy said, if you're throwing a stone, you're not nonviolent. And um, the sort of message that I got was that first of all, uh, again, picking up a stone and throwing it at a tank is, um, a way to claim your humanity, to be defiant, to maintain your self-esteem, and to also say, I own this stone, this is mine. And that there's also a very long tradition of throwing stones as a form of protest. And so we, would, we had these debates endlessly about whether, so I now call it unarmed resistance because a stone is not a military weapon. And you know, it's very clear that if you throw a stone into an oncoming car and it breaks the window, people could die. But 99.99999% of the time, this is a 15 year old throwing a stone at a tank. Um, and that 15 year old will end up being arrested in the middle of the night and spend six months in jail. And that's what happens over and over again. So what do I see for the future? Um, you know, I don't know how it's all gonna turn out, but it seems to me that whatever political solution we have for the future has to be based on human rights for all. And whether it's two states or one state or federation or whatever it's gonna be, and I really honestly don't know, it has to be based on equal human rights. And if we can get that as the foundation, then I think it's possible for everybody to work together to actually get to a peace ending. And also I think that what's been proven is that the people there haven't been able to solve it. So this is gonna take um, international pressure and grassroots pressure and people are melting here. So I'm going to stop <laughs> and hopefully we can get the air conditioning on. And I'll meet you. So for Jews, being victimized by an outside Christian culture it's part of our core identity. We all feel like we all experienced the Holocaust and we all survived the Holocaust. For Palestinians, the Nakba is also a huge catastrophe. But for Palestinians, there has never been an opportunity to have closure on this trauma. Um, and this all uh, led to uh, my co-organizing delegations to Israel. We got into the um, Gaza once um, and to the West Bank since 2003 every year. 
And um, as was mentioned, I wrote a book about this experience, Broken Promises, Broken Dreams. And I started um, book touring, because you know a lot of people won't invite an activist, because that's kind of scary, but you know, a doctor who wrote a book, that's kind of scary. 